Hi. Well, I'm still Mark, and we are still starting a series on the Book of Kings. And I was wondering, uh, am, I, am I right here? Yep. I was wondering if you were to uh, tell a story about the kings of Israel and Judah, and if you had to cover a nearly 400-year span of history... Um, and you had to go, and I know you can't read the details, but you can look at this later, but if you had to cover a period of nearly 400 years of history down, past Israel, the northern kingdom, being destroyed by Assyria and scattered through the lands, past the destruction of Judah and the fall of Jerusalem under, under Nebuchadnezzar in 587 BC, if you had to cover that whole span, how would you start the story? How would you start it? The books of First and Second Samuel, they talk about the reign of David and they finish with him reigning over a united kingdom of Israel, a unified 12 tribes. 12 tribes descended from 12 sons of Jacob called Israel, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, to whom was given the promises that I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and the nations will be blessed through you and I will give you a land, that pocket of land we call Canaan or Palestine, tucked in between Egypt and Syria and Babylon. How to start it? Well, I suppose, why not close off the reign of David? Let's begin with an ending. Let's start with the reign of that chosen king, that king after God's own heart. A few weeks ago, we looked at Psalm 23, and there I described him as the shepherd of Israel who described himself as a sheep. Humbly described himself as a sheep. Well, all right, let's start there. Where is this king sheep? Where is the king sheep? Turn the page quietly, let's take a peep. Here is our king sheep, fast asleep. You see that in verse 1? King David is old and advanced in years. The dark shadows of the valley of death loom over him. The giant killer has become a sleeping giant. A hot-blooded king has been defeated by the cold and shivers in his bed. In verse 2, Therefore his servants say to him, Ha! Huh, let a young woman be sought for my lord the king. Let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms that my lord the king may be warm. <laughs> what? what is going on here? Look at the lengths that these servants, these helpful servants go to to find the right heater. They sought for a beautiful woman throughout all the territory of Israel. And they found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. Oh, and the young woman was very beautiful a, a thorough and a very public search was conducted throughout the land it's a kind of ancient beauty pageant it's a bit like the search for queen esther isn't it and i reckon that may not be your first thought for a solution to the problem of old age and bad circulation <laughs> what's wrong with a hot bath hot rocks wrapped in a blanket or for that matter what's wrong with cuddling up to one of the several wives that King David already has. And why does a heater need to be beautiful? Well, you know, perhaps a young woman in his arms is going to rekindle a fire in his belly, the famous passion and rejuvenate him. You know, the last time that we heard of someone being embraced in someone's arms in their bosom was when Nathan was talking about Bathsheba being embraced by Uriah. Before... He was, she was snatched away by that insatiable lust of David. Or perhaps they're solving the problem of an heir by giving David the opportunity to produce one. Well, these aren't interpretations, but they are questions. They're my questions, but... I will say there's one thing that's clear. The servants are steering the ship while David shivers in his bed. And in verse 4, uh, Abishag was of service to the king. The king attended to him, but the king knew her not. Despite what, whatever service she may have been intended for, despite perhaps uh, what she may have waited for, despite 
perhaps what the king's desire may have been, the only service she actually supplies is as a hot water bottle, in the words of Gary Miller. Now, guys, beyond us being uncomfortable with talking about someone's bedroom activity, I imagine also we're quite uncomfortable with this speculation about the servant's motives and, more importantly, about the motives of this famous saint. Well, welcome to the Book of Kings, where life is messy, where motives aren't clear, where life waxes and wanes but finally fades. How did it get to this? And can anything be done about it? And what will happen next? Is there any hope for Israel with such a feeble king and a frail kingdom under the care of administrators? What of the promised Davidic dynasty? If these are the questions that we ask after this glimpse of the frail David, they're also the questions that the author wants us to ask on a larger scale. He wants his readers to ask Readers like the exiles sitting out here by the rivers of Babylon, cast out of home and land and away from the temple. Or perhaps the readers who have returned to the land, as we looked at in the book of Ezra, but it's lost all its former glory. The questions that we want to ask as we go through the book of Kings are, how did it get to this? There is a slide if it pops up, but if it doesn't, it's okay. How did it get to this? Can anything be done now? Yes, slide through a few more. How did it get to this? Why why the downward spiral of sin and rebellion and idolatry? What was it that angered God? Why the severe judgment? Can anything be done about it now, whether as individuals or a nation? Is there only judgment or is there any value in repentance? And thirdly, is there any hope? Is there any hope? What about God's grace? Or has he abandoned us forever? What of God's promise for David's dynasty to continue? That promise in 2 Samuel 7. And guys, aren't these the same sort of questions that plague us in hard times? How did it come to this? What have I done? What could I have done? What do I do now? And don't we ask them when we see people around us spiralling out of control, whether it's old age taking its toll on our loved ones, or whether we see people dropping the bundle, giving up, letting go. And the questions that we ask when we see the societal structures around us crumbling, when we see cold and shivering churches, weak leaders, spiralling civilization and the decaying environment. Surely there's hope, isn't there? It can't be this bad forever, can it? And as we're trying to process, as we take a breath and try and regroup, life happens, messy life. Something or someone adds complexity to the already intractable problem you have. Someone gets in the way, like Adonijah. The next one. Whatever David's servants had in mind in trying to find Abishag, Adonijah, for one, has assessed the situation swiftly and knows how to capitalise on the situation. With all that self-confidence of a prince... I really don't know how the people didn't know whether or not David slept with Abishag. Maybe it's because he didn't produce an heir. Maybe he made it public. But whatever the case, Adonijah has his view of it. He is too old. He is past it. It's time for me to step up. Because not all princes are as patient as King Charles. And so Adonijah, the son of Haggath, exalts himself, saying, I will be king. We're in verse 5. He prepared for himself chariots and horsemen, 50 men to run before him. And he was also a very handsome man and was born next after Absalom. So here is a son of David who is willing and eager to be king. Maybe this could be the solution to David's fragile kingdom. Or is it a part of the problem? Adonijah. 
His name means Yahweh is my Lord. From Yahweh, it's the Jah, and Adonai is Lord. But there are some problems with this nobly named prince. Because he clearly knows that the, the Yahweh who is supposed to be his Lord, who appointed David, he has appointed David, David is the rightful king, and he knows that David, the rightful king, has Solomon in mind as heir. Now, David hasn't done a good job of making that clear to everybody, but there's a reason that he excludes Solomon only of all the brothers from his self-coronation party. Adonijah's name and his lifestyle don't match up. And the storyteller makes it really clear that he's a pigeon pair with his brother. He's a perfect replica of his older, equally handsome, but usurping brother Absalom, who had previously gathered a very similar private guard and sought to take the throne directly from David. But he was slain by Joab. That's 2 Samuel 15. And there's more that's alarming because any Bible reader knows how dangerous it is to be self-exalting. I will be king. It, it sends us back to the garden, doesn't it, when he anoints himself by the serpent stone. David, the second king, Saul, the first king, they were appointed by God, but here comes someone self-appointing. It's a, it's a real departure, isn't it, from the pattern. And the other thing about his self-coronation is it risks the unity of the kingdom. Did you notice that even though he has the backing of senior administrators, they're all from the tribe of Judah? Verse 9. So the reader, who knows what happens in history, because they're sitting in history looking back, who knows that the kingdom is going to divide and knows how painful and detrimental that is, the reader then thinks, yeah, this is not a good look. This is not a good look as a king for all of God's people. This is probably more of an answer to the question, what went wrong? And of, of the questions we ask, you know, how did it get to this? One of the problems was a lack of discipline. Did you notice in verse 6? His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, why have you done thus and so? Early on, we see another weakness highlighted in the great King David. It's a flaw that we saw through First and Second Samuel as well, where Eli failed to discipline, where Samuel failed to discipline his sons, where David did. Priest and prophet and king failing to discipline. The author here knows this is going to displease your child. But he points out, and history shows us, just how displeasing it is to the whole nation just how detrimental it is to the whole community when there is no discipline. And I know that it's an area that we recognise that we fail in, um, and, and for some of us it's really painful to look at, at, at what's happened. Um, but also it's a fault that's really easy to see in others. Why don't they discipline better? Um, I wouldn't let my kids do that. But forgetting about other people, aren't we all, in some way, like David, letting go getting weary, losing control of one area of life or another, forgetting to discipline or forgetting to be self-disciplined, forgetting about kingdom business. And aren't we all in some way like Adonijah, exalting ourselves, forging ahead on our own path, the path that leads to our glory? Isn't it just so easy to wake up each morning with your own well-being in your mind? First and foremost, and don't you wonder, why aren't more people helping me? Why aren't people more pe people serving me? Because though we bear the name Christian, sometimes our name and our lifestyle doesn't match. So aren't these examples not just of what went wrong in Israel, but in every nation and in every individual heart? Well, let's get back to the story and ask the second question. What, if anything, can be done when things spiral? There's a problem faced by his servants, now specifically Nathan and Bathsheba. Why should they hope that David is going to put an end to this uprising when he's failed all his life to discipline the, the kid? And anyway, he's on his deathbed. He's past caring for the kingdom. And beyond that, he's just ignorant. 
He's an unknowing king. They've got to say something because just as David was too physically decrepit to know Abishag intimately, he's too mentally or socially unaware. He's got no knowledge of events in his own kingdom. See that in verse 11? Nathan said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, haven't you heard Adonijah, the son of Haggath, has become king? And David, our Lord, does not know it. And Bathsheba says to David directly, Adonijah is king, although you, my Lord, do not know it. That's verse 18. So they have to say something. And when they do say something, it's a humble appeal. Did you see the, the humiliation Bathsheba faces? She used to go into the king in his bedroom, and Abishag the Shunammite is attending to the king. Abishag the Shunammite is attending to the king. But in verse 16, Abishag bows and pays homage to the king. How humiliating. Yet the king, with his hot water bottle, is still bowed to as king. And both Nathan and Bathsheba bow before this king as they approach. So it's a humble appeal and it's a reasoned appeal. When they do say something, it's a reasoned appeal. Bathsheba appeals on the basis of David's own words. Verse 17, My Lord, you swore to your servant, that's me, you swore to me by the Lord your God, saying, Solomon, your son shall reign after me. He shall sit on my throne. And, and she appeals on the basis of his duty as king. In verse 20, My Lord the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you. For you to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my Lord, the king, after him. You are supposed to be the king and choose your successor. It's your right and the people's weight. So it sounds pretty straightforward, really. Uh, Put this way, it could be a really good model for tackling problems within institutions, within um, business and government, or even within the church. How you approach leaders, you know. Come with humility. Make a reasoned appeal. Leave the decision with the leader. And that, that is a great idea. But again, there's the complexity in the narrative. Since when does the prophet of God need to recruit political allies like the king's wife, Bathsheba? Did Samuel ever hesitate to rebuke Saul directly? Why does he need to lobby Bathsheba appealing to her self-interest? You know you're in danger, Bathsheba. I'm not denying that that Danger is real and probable. Why does Nathan need to appeal to her by saying, hey, you know the son of Haggath is, is going to become king? That means she'll be the queen mother. Is he trying to appeal to her with thoughts of glory? Yeah, actually, the queen mother's a powerful position. Why doesn't he just walk into the king as he's done before with a word from the Lord rebuking him as in, as in the sin of uh, Uriah and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 12. They're questions to ask. I don't know the answers, but I think that they're, um, just like with the Abishag controversy, motives aren't always clear. I think they're there, not for us to answer about Nathan and Bathsheba, but they are questions that we can ask about ourselves, about our lives, me about me, you about you. When I want the leadership to change their mind, is it for the sake of right? Is it for the sake of truth? Or is it for my comfort? Is it for my recognition? If I'm so convinced I'm right, why do I need to rally supporters, collaborators, tactically orchestrate things? And what about when you pray? When you approach the heavenly king, are you seeking solutions to your own personal problems, to your own safety, to your own comfort and personal glory first and foremost? I mean, it's fine to pray about those things. But first and foremost, is that your sole goal or are we seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness? They're questions to ask. When I evaluate my own heart, I see a blend. I see a mix of motives, good and bad. And also, don't be surprised if someone like me comes along questioning your motives. It's going to happen. So what can be done? What do we do in these situations? Act wisely. Act. Do something for the kingdom. But just check your motives. And also don't be surprised if someone else questions them. Well, the third question we want to ask uh, for here and for the whole book of Kings is what hope is there? We've asked how did it come to this? What can we do about it? What hope is there? Here we're really asking will the real king please stand up? 
Did you notice the change in David from verse 28? His servants have pleaded with him and he responds. He starts barking orders, didn't he? Send in Bathsheba. He's revived as he recalls the living Lord. In verse 29, the one whose vigor never abates, the living Lord, he recalls the countless times that God has stepped in to redeem him and that gives him the confidence that it's going to be the same in this case. And so, despite Adonijah's attempted coup and his support, David acts on his promise. As I swore, Solomon shall sit on my throne. And then Bathsheba bows, no doubt, much more sincerely. Her heart thrills. This is the king that she remembers. And she says, May my Lord King David live forever. And I've got no doubt she means it. And it's a pretty common thing to say to a king. But there's an irony there, isn't it? There's a big irony because, as we know, he's not going to live forever. The hope of Israel, in fact, rests with great David's son. The one that the mighty Benaiah was so boldly willing to say, may he be greater than David himself, in verse 37. All right, kids, it's time for action. Get all the king's horses, get all the king's men. Well, all the king's men and all the king's mule. Because this is the point in the story where it's just like that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie or that Liam Neeson or that Jason Statham movie. You know those movies? Have you ever started one of those and wondered, how is this going to end? No. (laughs) Ambiguity and mystery have vanished from sight. We know where this is heading. Because down in the valley, there's a map up there, down in the valley, about 600 metres from where Adonijah meets, um, Adonijah's down at Enrigel, and just 600 metres up there to the north is the Gihon Spring. Solomon is anointed, Solomon is appointed, Solomon is acclaimed, riding on the king's mount. The trumpet rings out, the ground seems to shake as the shouts of acclamation thunder and reverberate off the rocks. As the procession follows the new ruler up the hill, riding on the king's mule for Solomon to take his place on David's throne, the throne of Israel. What hope for Israel? Their hope is in the son of David. You know why it's such a long reading? Because just like three kisses from a Frenchman, just like three cheers at a party, to make it absolutely sure you got the message, three times the installation of Solomon was repeated. Did you notice that? First in David's command, then in the actual retelling of the event, and then in Jonathan's recount of the event. The hope for Israel is in the son of David, and he's a king who will be a king for all of God's people. As Bathsheba says, the eyes of all Israel are on you, not just Judah. And as David says in verse 35, I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. Unlike Adonijah, the true king reigns over all God's people and in unifying fashion. That means that down in Enrigel by the serpent stone, Adonijah's secret feast with supporters from Judah only pales into insignificance. Their own faces turn pale as they hear the uproar and as they hear the knock on the door. Joab is there wondering, what's all those trumpets? And and Jonathan the Abiathar hears, um, sorry, and Adonijah hears the door knock. Jonathan arrives, this is in verse 42, and Adonijah says, come in for you are a worthy man and you bring good news. Well, uh, no, no, it's not good news. Our Lord King David has made Solomon king. Solomon sits on the royal throne. And the result is that in verse 49, all the guests of Adonijah tremble and rise and go their own way. And Adonijah fears Solomon. Now I've got to say, this is a great picture, a great picture of what the gospel is. The gospel is an announcement of a new king or a king's triumph. But here it is used ironically. Adonijah thinks it's good news for him. But for the author, it really is good news. It's the announcement of a new king. It's an announcement that has to go out even to rebels and usurpers. A new king reigns. Why report this in such vivid deal? Why repeat it so many times? Because 
This is a shadow. This is a pattern. This is a type. This is, demonstrated for us in history, a picture of the hope of Israel. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Not a king who exalts himself, but a king who is appointed by God. This is the hope of Paul in Romans 1. When he writes to the Romans, he says in verse 1, Romans 1 verse 1, he says, I'm, I'm all about the good news that was prepared by God, that was promised by God beforehand through his prophets. It was promised by God beforehand by his prophets in the scriptures, these same scriptures. And it's about his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. We saw that David was excited to see his son lifted up. He rejoiced and he worshipped though his eyes, when his eyes saw it. Even though Benaiah said, I want him to be greater, he still worshipped. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has granted someone to sit on my throne, my own eyes seeing it. He rejoiced to see Solomon, but you know what? The exiles are sitting in Babylon. And they know Solomon wasn't all that. He actually contributed to the demise of Israel. So the hope... For the exiles were still to come. And they're still waiting. And when we get to Simeon in Luke's gospel, Simeon, he's hoping, it's been revealed to him that he will see this. And he sees the baby Jesus. And his heart rejoices. And he says, praise be to God that I have seen the Lord's anointed, the Lord's Messiah. That one who was humble, who came riding on a donkey like Solomon, entering the city with the shouts and acclamation of the people, Hosanna to the son of David. This Jesus was exalted, lifted up on a cross where all could see his true submission to God's will, his willingness to save his people. And this Jesus lay in a tomb dead, but he was exalted, raised up. Back in Romans 1 verse 4, this son of David was declared to be the son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead. He was exalted to sit on the throne of his father. God, the true and lasting King. And so the hope for all people is Jesus, the Son of David. It is publicly declared as good news. But this public declaration is also a warning. And it's a gospel that requires a response. Whether it's for Adonijah, for you, or for me. Because when it comes to explaining the gospel... It's all very well and important to talk about the love of God sending Jesus to take away sins and forgiveness. But is that universally applied so that all are washed clean? No. And it's all very well to talk about having to receive the gift, that forgiveness by faith in Jesus as our saviour, just as receiving a free gift is no value unless you receive it from the hands of the giver. That's, that's fine, that's true. But it's not the whole picture, is it? When Paul proclaimed the good news to the Athenians in Acts 17, verse 30, he said, God now calls on all peoples of every nation everywhere to repent because Jesus has been appointed the judge of all, appointed by God to be judge. That's what was proved at the resurrection. That's what was proved when he was exalted to be God's king. God calls on all men everywhere to repent. God calls on all women everywhere to bow the knee. And do you see how that point was so clearly illustrated in the story of Solomon and Adonijah? Adonijah fears he'll be labelled as a rebel for excluding Solomon, and he runs to the altar. So in verse 52, what was Solomon's response? If he will show himself a worthy man, not one of his hairs shall fall to the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. So King Solomon sent and they brought him down from the altar. And he came and he paid homage to King Solomon. And Solomon, finding him worthy, not declaring him wicked, says, you may go. Go to your house. He walks away. A free man. Are you worthy or wicked? You've got to take note. It doesn't matter what you've done to this point in your life. It doesn't matter how much you've dropped the bundle like King David. It doesn't matter whether you've been a rebel like King Adonijah. Whether you've been exalting yourself and living life your way. 
It doesn't matter how self-interested you've been seeking your own safety and security. What matters now, what determines whether you're worthy or wicked, is how you respond to this king. It doesn't matter if you've grown up bearing the name Christian. Adonijah, Yahweh is my Lord. You, you were born into that family. Maybe you married into that family. It doesn't matter what label you bear. It doesn't matter what tribe you belong to. Canterbury Gardens or Presbyterian or Brethren or whatever. What matters is your response to Jesus the King. So, have you bowed the knee to him? Have you submitted to his rule over your life? Do you need to do that again today? Have you asked him to declare you worthy, despite what wickedness you may think? Submit to him. I'll invite the music team to come up. I'm just going to give us a chance to pray. If you want to recommit, if you want to bend the knee to Jesus now as they come up, we'll, we'll just pray. Lord Jesus, there's a sense in which we know that you are the king and sometimes we don't like to acknowledge it. Um, we know that we're all not perfect followers of you. We recommit ourselves to you. We bow the knee to you. And some of us have never submitted to you. But I pray, Lord, give them the heart to bend the knee today. Because, friends, this exalted David is our hope. Of him alone it's truly said, age shall not weary him nor the years condemn. No plans to overthrow his rule are beyond his knowledge. I, I, I didn't say amen. I, I, I'm talking to you now. He's the one that reigns on high until he puts all enemies under his feet. He's the one who is with us in times of darkness and struggle, when society around us crumbles. He's the one who will strengthen us so that we who are faithful servants who pay him homage can be busy doing whatever it is we can for his kingdom until he returns. And when he does, be welcomed into his presence. Let's sing, your will be done. Let's sing, my heart, stand up with us. My heart is drawn to self-exalting. Help me seek your kingdom first. My heart is drawn to self-exalting, but help me seek your kingdom first. Thank you.